bad session to have the first one on a Saturday morning, so I appreciate you getting up. So what works best is just pure pictures. So the first talk is just pictures. And the pictures are just very simple. It's those, how do we diagnose the different types of choroidal neovascularization that we see in our clinics? And previously, when I started as a trainee, it was all fluorescin. But now, basically, that's invasive and expensive, and most of us use OCT. So this um, talk is primarily OCT-driven, but I'll use the other multimodal imaging, fluorescin and OCT, to make, um, uh, uh, explain where those additional imaging modalities are useful in helping your diagnosis. So I'm going to talk about um, the features to help classify the type of crawled knee vascularization you have, um, different forms of pigment epithelial detachments, and how you use the, those imaging modalities to help in your uh, management and retreatment decisions of your patients. And so we're all aware that um, age-related macular degeneration is still the commonest cause of uh, uh, poor vision in uh, the Western world. And the default pathway is going from early um, dry age-related macular degeneration um, the hallmarks of which are drusen and uh, pigment uh, chain alterations in the macula. And if we all live long enough, we think we'd all get geographic atrophy. And a subgroup of patients may get a secondary complication where they develop choroidal nevascularization. We don't know what the tipping points are. And when you get choroidal nevascularization, it's um, got different classification systems. And um, this is the one now in the OCT era we most use. And um, this classification is an expansion of a classification used to help us understand why 20 years ago different types of surgery to remove um, choroidal neovascular membranes had uh, different outcomes. And so this is an anatomic classification, type 1, type 2, type 3, and it, um, idiopathic polypoidal choroidal vasculopathy that can be also a form of type 1. I'm going to go through all of this in more detail. So type 1 choroidal neovascularization is um, where you, it's the form you normally get in uh, aging patients. The patients have um, an aging RPE, and when the neovascular process starts, it can find a plane between Brooks membrane and the RPE. And this is the cartoon showing it, and this is the OCT correlate, elevated RPE, subretinal, medium hyperreflective material, and it may then have an exudative change over the top of it. We're now realizing that these type 1 CNVs can be quiescent and just sit there. So you have a patient you're injecting in one eye, and you're scanning the other eye, you can see this form quiescent type 1 CNV in the fellow eye with no fluid, and it can just sit there. The weight of evidence at the moment is not to initiate treatment because it may not progress for years, but there's a higher risk of progression. There's, an, there's a fluorescent correlate. It's not the same. So in fluorescent angiography, when they were doing the original argon laser trials, they had another definition which was classic or occult. And that's not absolutely the same as type 1, but similar. So the correlate of type 1 CNV is fibrovascular pigment epithelial detachment, and this is the fluorescent correlate, which is speckled hyperfluorescence. It may have radial lines, which is the RPE folds, and if you have stereoangiography, which hard, we hardly ever get now, sadly, it'll be slightly elevated and slightly leak late. So that's type 1. So it's under the, the native um, RPE and above Brooks membrane. And the reason that was important in the old days where surgical, my surgical colleagues used to try and yank them out, they did terribly. Because when you tried to pull this out, you'd pull off all your RPE, and they didn't do very well. And I mentioned about quiescent CNV. So this is a, a form of type 1 CNV. If you look at the fellow eye, you will see a shallow separation between the RPE and Brooks membrane. And it's medium hyperreflective. There's no fluid. The patient may be relatively asymptomatic. Um, if you do a fluorescein, there may be some very late, slight speckled 
leak. And this, again, is probably the correlate in the past of late leakage of undetermined origin. And there may be a plaque on ICG. In contrast, um, this is um, the type 2 CNV that we more commonly see in younger patients than myopes, which we'll hear about in a later talk, inflammatory membranes, and some AMD patients. And this is um, the cartoon from Don Gass's paper, again, trying to explain why patients with type 2 CNVs did better with surgery than the type 1s. Because provided this stalk of blood vessels is not under the fovea, and you yank out this membrane, you're not pulling off all the RPE. And so they did relatively better than the patients with the type 1 membranes. So if you can imagine a lacquer crack in a myopic patient's a focal weak point, and there's some tipping point where blood vessels grow and leak and bleed in the subretinal space. Now, in a young patient with healthy RPE, the RPE can still pro proliferate and enlarge and grow around it. So you think of a myopic membrane, with time, it often pigments, and that's actually a good sign. And you'll get certain characteristic features uh, when you've got a good treated endpoint. So this is OCT comparing a type 1 CNV. So if you remember the cartoon, under the RPE, there's leak above it. And a type, 1, um, a type 2 CNV, where you have the RPE here, it's not elevated. There's a focal break here. There's either subretinal fluid or subretinal hyperreflective material or blood, and maybe intraretinal fluid, depending on the activity. Um, type 3 CNV is something, that, again, described by various different people with various different synonyms. And this is um, one of the original cases um, that Don Gass um, described. He called it chorioretinal anastomosis. Um, Yanuzzi's group called it, are we okay? Yep. Uh, Yanuzzi's group um, called it RAP, or retinal angiometer proliferation. And the, the first clinical sign um, he noticed was parafoveal intraretinal hemorrhage with no subretinal hemorrhage. And he followed these patients up for years, and they eventually developed choroidal vascularization. He's wondering why, if it's a CNV process, would they get intraretinal hemorrhage before subretinal hemorrhage? And he thought and thought and thought, and he hypothesized that the primary problem is proliferation of vessels in the retina, and then at some point it connects to the subretinal space. Oops. So um, that's often the earliest sign, parafoveal intraretinal hemorrhage. And you can see the connecting vessel stalk uh, between the retina. And often, with time, you get a type 1 CNV that it connects with. Uh, ICG and OCT showing um, the PED, the connecting stalk between the mid-retina and the PED, and the hot spot on ICG. Hot spots on ICG are nonspecific. You get them in polypoidal and occult, but that combination is consistent with uh, RAP. Uh, angio CT can be very useful uh, to avoid needing a fluorescent angiogram. In most cases, it's a debatable point as to whether you always need a fluorescent angiogram. If you have a patient with um, extensive drusen, hemorrhage, extradirt, and elevation on the OCT, you know, it's not really going to be anything else. But occasionally, we, I still see patients who have vitelliform lesions who've been injected for a year, and then we've got to have a difficult conversation. So if you're in doubt, um, you can try angio-CT. There'll be a course later today on interpretation. It's quite, it's quite a long discussion about going through all the layers. So I urge you, who, those of you who don't know about angio-CT, to come to the course later today. But um, you really need to interact with the angio-CT software to make sure you don't over-interpret or under-interpret the angio-CT. But if you sl um, slide down and look at the correct slab, you will highlight the choroidal neovascularization, which is shown here in this type 1 CNV. And this is the fluorescing speckled hyperfluorescence membrane there, double layer sign with high flow. Um, this is a myopic patient with a type 2 CNV, so the RP is not elevated, subretinal hyperreflective material, the pigmentation as the RP tries to cover it, there's hemorrhage as well, 
and, it, and there's a very beautifully delineated choroidal neovascular network on the angio-CT. Uh, angio-CT of RAP, again, you can see the high-flow signal um, connecting the retina to the pigment epithelial detachment. So can we use OCT alone? Is it as good as fluorescein? There are a few actually reasonable studies. Um, this is one from Inui and co-workers where they had a gold standard where a bunch of graders had the fluorescein, OCT, and structural OCT and angio-CT and said, if we look at all of that, is it CNV or not? And then, the, then you had mass graders looking at some, but not all, of the imaging modalities. And they found that OCTA and the structural OCT, which you'll get anyway on the angio CT machine, was as good at detecting type 1 CNV as fluorescein alone or OCTA alone. There is a few caveats. If you have an untreated type 1, they can have relatively low flow below the detec signal detection, and you may miss that. Um, okay, I'll skip that one. Okay, so this is an example of a patient where I think uh, OCTA is uh, particularly useful. So this is a patient, 45-year-old, who had uh, central serous chorioretinopathy, uh, was previously injected elsewhere with no change, because they originally thought it may have been a CNV, but it made no difference, and it was actually CSR. But then the patient had another drop in vision. And this was the OCT here, and you can see there's the... Uh, what looks like a serous PD, but there's kind of this uh, opacity in the outer retinal structure. And the patients just notice a drop in vision. The fluorescein is here that just showed speckled hyperfluorescence. So with CSR or with a type 1 CNV, the fluorescein will show speckled hyperfluorescence. And unless you get um, an angio CT or there's visible hemorrhage, it can be very difficult to tell the two. And the patient's already had anti-VEGF. So this is where angio-CT is very, very good um, at looking at uh, whether a CNV complex is present or not. So um, with the angio-CT, you need to look at the, stru the uh, structural um, scan together with the angio-CT and look at the different layers and look at the high-flow signals. This is a high-flow signal in red. And make sure it's not a projection artifact. Again, we'll go through this in more detail in the course. Um, and as we go through, this is the angio-CT. Is this a CNV? You need to look at the corresponding structural on FAS, and this is actually a retinal, superficial retinal vessel projecting down. But as we go further down, there's this squiggle here that's different from the Y-shaped retinal vessel that is a CNV. The patient was treated and improved. The fluid didn't fully go away because they had CSR and CNV, but the vision improved. Again, something that's quite interesting, if you have CSR, you can have 6-9 vision. If you get CNV, suddenly the vision drops. So something different about the fluid with CNV and CSR that affects your, your vision. So CN, uh, that's the CNV complex. Oh, let me just get the red pointer on here. Yep, yeah, so that's the CNV complex. The Y here is the uh, retinal, superficial retinal vessel. That's a projection artifact, and that's the CNV complex. So polypoidal choroidal vasculopathy. Um, so this is something, again, uh, um, originally described by um, Yanutsi and Gas, and this is the first ever described case of polypoidal. We had, had the privilege of spending some time with Don Gas many years ago. And this is a case that Lawrence Yanutsi saw of a serous PED in a hypertensive African-American American female with these reddish nodules around the edge. And before OCT, Don Gas drew this which was remarkable. So he hypothesized there are large choroidal vessels herniating above Brooks' membrane into the sub-RP space. And um, this is a, a, mo a modern case here, serous PD, elevations, reddish nodules, ICG, multi, uh, multiple nodules with a branching vascular network. There are now attempts at um, clinical criteria for this, but they're mainly based on Southeast Asian patients from the Everest trial, which is having um, a hyperfluorescent hyper nodule on ICG plus an additional sign, which includes a dark surround, pulsatility on the video clip, which I think is virtually impossible to see, branching vascular network, hemorrhage is not part of that. So this patient has multiple dilated nodules, um, um, 
nodules here with a branching vascular network. And on OCT, remember what I said about Dongas and the herniating vessel here? If you zoom in, this is what we assume is the larger choroidal knuckle going through Brooks' membrane and herniating above, remarkably similar to what Don Gas drew, and there can be multiple of those. And uh, we observed that there are certain OCT features that may make you think about this, these multiple PEDs, the notches in between, and this kind of extra lumen in the middle. And one of our previous fellows did a very nice mass study where we had a gold standard diagnosis on ICG and wondered what features could predict that. And if you have certain features on an on a, um, OCT, it's very good at separating a type 1 CNV versus polypoidal, where you may consider argon laser or PDT adjunctive therapy if you have polypoidal. And it does occur in Caucasians, and we do see the pure form in Caucasian patients and not just um, patients with pigmented skin. So this is the sharp peak PED, the notches in the, the white arrows in between, and then these um, lumen light change in the middle. So if you see that, ICG, they may well have polypoidal. And this um, slide just summarizes some of those um, features I've just seen between type 1 CMV, type 2, uh, RAP, choriretinal anastomosis, and polypoidal choroidal vasculopathy. So um, another thing that can end up in the injection clinics, so in, in more fields we have an in, a pooled injection clinics where we have nurse injectors, um, and um, uh, paramedical staff who help in the retreatment decisions. The problem is, if you get, get it wrong as they go in, they can get injected for a long time before you realize they may have this, which is a serous PED. So a serous PED, smooth dome elevation. The problem is, as it becomes chronic, the smooth dome elevation um, may start getting reflectivity in it, and you may get the teleform light changes at the top. So the teleform, as in best disease, are deposits of shed outer segments that build up between the retina and the RPE and the autofluoresce. Um, and we described a lot of these features in this review article here. Um, the problem with just looking at OCT alone, you have to be disciplined. You have to look at every single slice of the OCT, and those slices on the OCT have to be close together. So here, if we look at this, smooth domed elevation, evenly hyperreflective. You can have a vitelliform or a little peak fluid at the top. That doesn't mean it's CNV. If you look at the ICG, you have a hyperfluorescent notch. So this is a vascularized serous PED. If you'd not looked at every slice and not cut through the bottom, you'd have missed it. So the danger with looking at single-slice OCTs is very easy to miss things, and we're very attuned to looking at things on FAS. So you need to try and look at on FAS if you have access to it. Be very disciplined and look at all that and think about the patient's symptoms of the sudden change, and should you do additional tests. So in the last few minutes, just a few features of prognosis. So if you have AMD, there are additional features that you may see on your imaging that may alter um, how the patient may do. So the, you've got CNV in one eye, and you see this, um, a reticular pattern, and this is um, subretinal drusenoid deposits or reticular pseudodrusen, a net-like appearance. So reticular is Latin, not Greek, isn't it? Yeah. Um, so, so this is a smooth dome form of uh, reticular pseudodrusen. It's above the native RPE. And then there's the more common peaked form. Again, above the RPE, it breaks through the ellipsoid zone and through the external limiting membrane here. These patients often have thinner choroids. They have more night-dark uh, adaptation problems. They're more prone to GA and more prone to RAP. And these are the ones that you treat for wet AMD, and they're the ones that within two years often develop geographic atrophy. Um, and so, not great. Be complicated by RPE rips. So this is a uh, type one uh, CNV elevated RPE, and then the fluid expands. It's like blowing up a balloon. It bursts. The RPE rolls under itself. So this is corrugated here. There is no RPE here. So the light can penetrate. So there's hyper transmission of light into the choroid. This is a better example with a neuro CT device. So. Um, this is a fluorescein. The RPE is ripped here in this direction. So we see the uh, scleral hyperfluorescence here. There's more double layers of RPE here, so it's corrugated, so the folds. 
which is this here, and no RPE here. So you follow the RPE line is missing, and light can penetrate through, just like with geographic atrophy in this hypertransmission of light illuminating the choroid. So missing RPE, um, double RPE or rolled up RPE. Um, vitreo macular traction, again, may alter your decision making. Um, now, uh, this is the serous PED. As I said, it can be confusing because as it evolves, it starts collapsing. And half of them will collapse, causing atrophy. Half of them will get choroidal neovascularization. So even if there's no CNV when you first see the patient, you need to warn the patient, I'm not injecting you now. If they come back in six months with CNV, they say you missed it or they've gone somewhere else and got injected. So you need to actually have that discussion documented. There, unfortunately, from natural history studies, from um, the AREDS trial, these unfortunately do very badly. If they don't collapse and cause atrophy with poor vision in two years, they may get CNV. Um, and just predictive factors, large CNV area um, and presence of G8 baseline and subretinal hyperreflective material can be associated with poor outcomes. It's going to whiz through some of these other features. So subretinal hyperbacterial is can clear, but it also can be a continuum towards subretinal fibrosis where you may consider stop treat treatment. So this is definite fibrosis. These are um, uh, cysts which may or may not respond to in injections, and these are tubulations. When the, um, the uh, RP is usually gone from a variety of causes, it could be fibrosis, geographic atrophy of multiple different causes, the photoreceptors get a response where they may roll up into themselves, and these are tubulations. They're not signs of disease activity, and you don't need to inject them. Um, differential diagnosis, so you, um, I, I'm going to save this one more for the angio CT course. The teleform lesions, again, you don't want to be injecting these, so these are above the native RPE, smooth domed, even hyperreflective material. They d uh, do not just occur in best disease or adult for teleform. Many forms of AMD, especially reticular pseudodrusin and cuticular drusen, often coexist with the teleform lesions. Not a reason to inject. Uh, obviously, vitreo macular traction. Um, we know about the features of injections, which is sub or intraretinal fluids. We'll talk about that next. Um, and I'll probably leave it there because we, my colleague's going to talk about myopia. So any questions uh, about features um, of imaging on, for AMD or CNV? Yes. So, um, so the question is, why is their vision declining if it's a quiescent CNV? So, um, the best studies to date are show that if you do microperimetry, it may decline slightly. But if it's quiescent, unless they're getting geographic atrophy or a cataract their visual acuity is pretty good. The problem is, so if you have a quiescent CNV, so just to remind everyone, this is where you have a type 1 membrane, usually in the fellow IVI you're injecting, and your CT you see a membrane, but there's no fluid. So um, the, the literature is conflicting. There is a natural history study that say they're 14 times greater at risk of developing active progressive CNV. There's another natural history says, study that says the chance of them developing act, active progressive CNV is 10% a year, which is the same as your fellow ICNV rate. The problem is twofold. Um, you then be first uh, treating these patients with no clear endpoint. So when we treat a wet AMD, we either treat continuously, like in the original trial, are you going to treat this patient every single month or two months for the rest of the year, or based on OCT criteria, sub or intraretinal fluid? There isn't any to begin with. So what's your treatment endpoint? The second thing, there's now an emerging literature that type 1 CNV may be protective against geographic atrophy. And, and um, there's a, multiple papers um, out from various different groups, fluid. even with fluid. So the presence of a type 1 CNV is protective, potentially. Again, there's lots of confounders. There are about four different studies that have all gone in that direction. So um, there's a recent one, I think, from Frank Holtz's group that's just come out last week, uh, where they mapped out where you get GA if you have a stable type 1 CNV and it avoids the type 1 CNV. And there's other sub-analyses from CAT and so on and so forth. 
So you've got a patient that I would probably suggest there may be other causes. We know that AMD is symptomatic if you do tests, and we know the microphone slowly goes down. But when do you stop treating? Are you going to inject this patient forever? Because you know if you if you're going to extend it, what you extend it for. So it's a very difficult thing. The American... No, no. So um, it enlarges anyway, and even if you inject them, they enlarge. So if you think of a, um, the studies on wet AMD, where they do angio CT, and you inject them, they enlarge anyway. It may enlarge less, but it may actually alter the benefit of the type 1 CNV. It may alter the way it works. So it may be that type 1 CNVs are a physiologic response when you get an ischemic choroid. So when we get older, our choroid thins. There's a body of evidence that part of the driver towards CNV is ischemia and ischemic outer retina. And it may be that a stable type 1 CNV is a physiologic response. And if it's stable and not leaking and causing scarring and fibrosis, it may actually be a good thing. And there's a body of thought almost arguing in a hy hypothetical way that I wish we could create type 1 CNVs to protect the retina. So we've got conflicting data. Um, the, you don't really know when to stop treatment. The American DRCR net group that now covers not just diabetes but AMD um, had all of industry together with them to plan a trial to do this. They said, okay, let's just preemptively treat all of these. They did, the, for, for once, Dan Martin, in a very un-American way, did all the numbers did a health economics analysis and said even if it works as good as it possibly could, the cost per quality would be a million dollars to treat one patient because it's so slow progressing versus waiting until it progresses and then inject them. And I'm going to give you an alternative in my next talk about maybe an alternative approach to doing that. So I would not, but I would warn them, the patient, they have a higher risk and really emphasize the importance of self-testing. We may change our views. We may get better information. We may have better ways of stratifying which ones really progress and start treating those. But at the moment, it's not something I would advocate. Yep. So, so um, I've not had any of my own cases where I've convincingly got that. The problem is, because we have pooled patients, I don't have my own personal long-term follow-up on those. Maybe I should pull all the ones and actually try and answer that question better. I'm part of a group called the CAM group that tries to define OCT features of AMD. And as part of that, my colleagues around the world, from New York, whatever, brought those cases where I've looked at them with them, and I'm convinced that's true. Because the autofluorescence returns to normal. You can see the OCT line growing back. It's probably not what Lyndon and uh, Lyndon's not here, Pete Coffey want to hear. Because actually, um, when you're younger, the RPE is not post mitotic. mitotic. It actually replicates in the peripheral retina and does slide and repair, as, as we can see. Um, so it does do that. But because no one really has any experience with that, no one can say whether you should or should not inject more or less. Obviously, if your RPE um, goes under the fovea, the other eye is good, you may or may not, you've got to be practical about the burden of treatment to the patient. Obviously, if it's in their only good eye, then your options are, if it's extra reveal, continue injecting. If it's sub then heroic surgery from you guys or stem cells or, or some other approach, um, is, it needs to be considered, and, and very quickly. Uh, do you, does anyone here, do you guys have any uh, um, centers that do MT360 or patch, or how do you handle that? It's very difficult everywhere, isn't it? Yeah. Good. You've got a uh, serious PD and yep. subretinal fluid. You do everything nice it is, et cetera, no signs of leakage or any signs of new vascularization. What do you do on those? Uh, it's a nightmare. 
So um, um, this is actually, considering the fact that you've got all these clinics at Morpheus and in the UK. So it's 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 very very difficult. So um, uh, so patients are often desperate, especially if they've had atrophy in the other eye from a serious PD. And so sometimes you the patient. Almost, so you, you can't see anything, but I said about the caveat of certain subgroup of type 1 CMVs you can't see on angio CT, and there are studies to demonstrate that. So if the patient's done badly in one eye, the patient is desperate and says, you know, why aren't you doing something? What I then do, I say, okay, there's no good evidence. In the past, I actually tried to PDT those like 10 years ago with not great results. I often give them a therapeutic trial of a couple of injections, but with a very defined exit. Otherwise, they're going to be injected forever. And I say, well, it, you could be the odd one that doesn't detect you've done terrible in the other eye. At least we've tried. And that's often something that you need a long conversation with the patient about, and you also want a clear exit strategy. And even if it doesn't respond, you then have to remind them that the other eye became atrophic, and there's a 50% chance of them becoming vascular, and even though it didn't work this time, it may work next time. The, the, this is a really not a great group to treat, and uh, you know we all find them difficult to manage. Yep. Oh yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, thank you for the reminder. Maybe we should go back to it. <laughs> Just the natural history of the thing. I mean, they flattened. Did you had the control group? Some patients with serious PDs, they are desperate. But if you left alone, they may have flattened anyway. I mean, uh, yeah, they but they flattened with atrophy. So it's a bit like there's two pathways. So like, well, if you have Drusen, you can either have Drusen regression with no RP atrophy or Drusen regression with RP atrophy. Serious PDs are the same. The ideal thing, it flattens, and there's no RP atrophy. The problem is they usually when they flatten, the RP atrophies. So um, how we get flattening without RP atrophy is a challenge. Again, maybe this is a surgical thing that needs to be approached because I think this is, this is a, probably a bigger group now, I think, than RP rips, and maybe I should um, encourage Lyndon and my RP transplant colleagues to consider this in the future. But the trouble is their vision's often very good initially. Are we... Yep. Uh, ICG, uh, SLO-based ICG with a video clip. Do we need to diagnose it? Okay, so you, there are two things. Uh, a purist in a retina center that has access to PDT and argon laser and a pragmatist in a busy center where you know from various studies that the average IPCV patient does as well with injections. So... Um, you may be giving more injections to your patient, but their ultimate visual acuity may be pretty similar if you don't. So I don't think it's medico-legally negligent not to do it, provided you assume it's a form of type 1 CNV that's leaking and you treat them if they're symptomatic and progressing. Um, the reason to do the ICG is you could then have the option of argon laser if the polyps are well extra foveal. You can just argon laser them. They're peripapillary. I, I, I've done that on lots of patients, and it works very well. No, no, it's well extra foveal. You can argon laser them, and that's uh, cheap and accessible for all of us. If they're close to the fovea uh, or sub foveal, you clearly can't. Or, the, yeah. So it, there are options. Again, um, that we don't have modern-day trials that really support that because the pharma companies are, aren't going to be interested in a anti-VEGF plus laser versus anti-VEGF alone trial. And um, so it's, it's probably not going to be answerable in a robust way. And if you're going to laser them, long exposure um, and just l a light white response. In the, talking about polyps, uh, mm. I mean, can you give us some insight or your views on the uh, trials to uh, sort of classify the different varieties of polyps, so uh, secondary or primary or related to CMV or others. I mean, 
any point of, of going through this conversation or not? What so the problem is, the, the, um, I think um, we probably need to do a, a European Caucasian study. So it's really driven by uh, Southeast Asian polypoidal definitions. We don't quite know if they work as well. And again, they're consensus opinions. So, the, um, so what happened was a, a, a group of the great and the good um, sat around at a meeting in Singapore and said, in our experience, this is what polyps were, which is the Everest criteria. And that has therefore been applied to everything else. Now, um, what you probably need to do is look at all the Caucasian patients, look at how they do, look at the features, and actually do an unbiased, what's called a cluster analysis, look at how the features aggregate together, and whether they predict future outcomes, and then use that as the definition. Um, so the definitions are not really evidence-based, but then they are, because if you think about it, our definitions of type 1 and type 2 CNV are this. Ultimately, you have to call something something, and we all call it the same thing. So I, I use the Everest criteria when I'm teaching because at least it's been put into clinical trials and it's well defined in a paper. Just to follow uh, Rosoro's question, mm. in a number of patients with uh, PCP, you don't see polyps. So you just use this branching vascular nerve. Yeah. So you make sure that's not a type one. So remember, there's now. <laughs> Okay, so it comes down to hypothesis. So um, originally they were deemed very se separate entities. So as I said, Afro African American hypertensive females versus type one CNVs in elderly Caucasian males. As we've now got better imaging, there's now a convergence of thought. Is the way you think of polypoidal is a form of type one CNV where you get so in type one CNV you get um, a CNV growing in the sub RP space as a Medusa-like network. But if the tips of those dilate or there are larger vessels herniating through, then that's a polypoidal variant. So the trouble is we don't, haven't got natural history studies where it, um, you have imaging showing an evolution of a type 1 network to a polypoidal network. And so it's not unclear if one evolves to another. Groups like Bailey, Freund's group, are very much into, oh, uh, polypoidal is um, uh, annu calls it aneurysmal type 1 CNV, i.e. they're the same thing or um, they're classified together. So in terms of anatomy, I can understand why they are, but what we don't understand is whether one for, uh, leads into the other. So one assumes they must do, because in order to get dilated endpoints, you have a branching um, um, vascular network, you must have fat to begin with, but you have the other form, as I shown on the OCT, of the really sharp PEDs with really large vessels going through it. So there may be subtypes within that. So I'm, I, I think there's still uh, a lot for us to understand about the evolution. I'm not sure whether you're going to be covering, I mean, it, it, is there another talk coming now? I can, I can yeah, I can talk, yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, I was just wondering, I mean, we can move on to myopia. Yeah, that's fine. Or perhaps uh, we need a few minutes just to sort of, if there is another talk, I'm not sure, just to summarize or give us a few tips on how to manage all the CMD cases. So some tips are okay. probably hard. So, so type 1, type 2, type 3, et cetera, polyps, just to Okay, okay. so um, first of all, imaging, um, High density raster OCT, you need to look at all the scans. You can't just have a printout and say, uh, yeah, I'm not going to look at the rest of it. A bit of discipline. If anything's unusual, if the vision and the OCT are disconcordant, you may need to consider extra imaging. Um, in terms of um, uh, type 1 and type 2 CNV, less important for AMD in terms of treatment. The importance is the signs of type one, type 2 CNV can be quite subtle in young patients, and you may miss it. Are you going to cover that, signs of type 2 CNV? Uh, no. Oh, in which case, I'll show you a couple of... Uh, no, type, which, which, type 2 CNV in myopia, or are you just going to call... Um, uh, in which case, I'll show a couple of... Okay, so... This is what I mean by type 2 CNV in myopia. So this is um, a MARPIC patient, a distended staphyloma. So you can see the real curvature there dipping down to the optic nerve, the tilted disc. And with type 2 CNVs, um, you often do not have 
sub or intraretinal fluid, probably because the more healthy RPE can still pump fluid. You get the subretinal hyperreflective material and you get this fuzzy border around the edge. And the activity is the fuzziness of this border. So if you remember the Don Gas um, drawing, there's a focal break and then the uh, membrane grows above the native RPE, which is that layer, and this patient is symptomatic. Even though it's extra reveal, the patient was symptomatic. And if you treat, you start getting a more defined border. There's a little bit of subre um, subretinal fluid that's now visible, and the end point of treatment is an incredibly well-defined border, um, which is where the RPE is growing over the top of it. And we think the RPE has antiangiogenic properties, and that's your end point of treatment. So, it's the re so the type 2 CNV um, can look quite different on an OCT in young patients. Usually in, in the older patients, it's very florid with lots of fluid and leak. But in myopic membranes, very subtle and can be quite small. So you need to do a dense raster scan, look at them all, and look for signs of this. And actually, I find it very difficult to manage type 2 CNVs without a very high quality OCT. Because seeing the change in the fuzziness of the border is very difficult without an OCT that tracks. Um, and so in, in, in my clinic, um, we have top cons on all the patients as they walk through the door, because that's quick and easy for the technicians to do. But for myop myopes, inflammatory membranes, um, genetic associated membranes, I get spectralis on those because I can track it and look at the real s subtle fuzziness so I know I feel comfortable at the defined end point of stopping treatment. So that's the, the end point of stopping treatment there. And there's another example here. So this is a patient, um, I think it's quite some time ago, when we just started first, first getting a, a Vastin. Um, so this patient had, um, oh, I think we're missing the first slide here. So the patient actually had um, the subretinal hyperreflective material, didn't want treatment initially, didn't like the idea of injections in the eye. Then the retina thickened a few weeks later and the vision declined, then got treated. And you can see here the end point of treatment. Oops, can I zoom in here? So the end point of treatment, which is the RPE growing above the CNV complex, really well-defined border, and that just sits there. It will not go away. And sometimes, with a bit of luck, your uh, ellipsoid zone and um, will, will actually reform above it and actually have pretty good vision. It'll still have distortion, but that is your end point there. Yep. Good? Yep. So time-wise, what do you want me... Do you want me to switch to myopia, and I could talk about several different things, whichever... It works. Do, you, do your talk if you like. I which mean, you which one? Um, um, GA? Packy, okay. I will do that. Yeah. Yeah. 